In the twilight where past and future meet, the Noir Penthouse provides a sanctum from the chaos of the Commonwealth. Originally used as a safe house for elite institute coursers on the hunt for escaped synths, this stylish apartment includes over 35 new workshop items, new clothing outfits, and a new quest, created by Tom Seddon, Bloodmeat08. The Noir Penthouse is going for 600 credits. But is it worth it? Let's find out. We'll go over the quest first. If you want to skip straight to the penthouse, you'll find timestamps to the different segments of this video in the description below. The next time we arrive in the Commonwealth, we start the quest Early Retirement. Listen to the strange signal. Tuning to the strange signal on our Pip-Boy radio. is indeed a strange signal. We discover that the signal is coming from the campus law offices near Cambridge. Heading that way, we can clear the campus law offices of raiders. Whereupon we find a new terminal, the Campus Law Office's terminal. It's locked with a novice lock. After God. hacking it, we see a bunch of gobbledygook, inky, gibberish, and then decryption successful. We can choose to open the encrypted message. Begin message. B263. We have reports that Institute communications are being intercepted. Until we have inspected all locations, communication must be restricted to our encrypted surface terminals only. In addition, your penthouse headquarters is being cleared for any listening devices, and the locks are being changed. The location of the new key will be provided upon mission completion. Your next targets are two synths that escaped the Institute and have gone into hiding in the Commonwealth. R311 and PR15. They are highly dangerous, so their disposal may be necessary. Recon teams have confirmed multiple sightings of them together near Fairline Hill Estates. This is odd behavior for since who have had their memories wiped, so it is imperative that this is handled immediately. Little else is known of their assumed identities, their whereabouts, or what they may be planning. Continue operating under the guise of a detective to obtain any information you can. Report back when targets have been reclaimed or otherwise neutralized. End message. So an Institute courser has been living and working out of a penthouse above ground, posing as a detective while investigating and then reclaiming missing synths. He is hunting two right now who were last seen at Fairline Hill Estates. Heading that way... Where did everybody go? Used to be a small settlement here. I covered the Fairline Hill Estates and the mystery of what went on here in a dedicated video that you can watch here. But the coordinates we retrieved from the terminal points us to a house on the southern end of this cul-de-sac. We could go through the front door, but heading into the garage we see that the door here is missing. Despite this, the front door is slightly ajar. Could this be evidence that someone has been here? Heading upstairs. Oh, someone has been here, and he is dead. Examining the body, we see that this is the corpse of B-263, the Institute Courser. On his body, we find B-263's encryption key, B-263's mission log, a unique weapon called Early Retirement, which does 25% more damage against synths, which makes sense for a courser, and a unique outfit called the Detective Coat which reduces damage from robots by 15%. And again, it makes sense for a courser. We also find some ammunition, a stealth boy, and six synth components. Looks like this courser has killed five escaped synths. On the ground next to him is a detective fedora, another unique item that has been reskinned to match the coat. To find out what went on here, we can start by reading B-263's encryption key. But we just see a bunch of gibberish. This must be useful for something else later. So instead, we'll read B-263's mission log. Targets R-328 and J-904 have been reclaimed. 
R-328 had tried to become a provisioner to stay on the move, but all it took was giving a bottle of pre-war whiskey to some farmers to find out his routes. R-328 gave himself up as soon as he saw me. He knew what would happen otherwise. J-904 was hiding in plain sight as a supply vendor in Diamond City. He thought surgery would hide his appearance, but I was able to get his resident history file from a confidant. After I pieced together who he really was, I confronted him in the market. He cried out to the guards that I was a synth, but nobody believed him. I've helped enough people around here that I've gained their trust, and Mayor McDonough was there to back me up. I told everyone J904, or Harold as he was calling himself, had been stealing from farmers and selling the goods. Nobody tolerates a thief, and they didn't care what I did with him after that. I am now returning to my designated above-ground headquarters to await further instructions. In the next one, Target 03442, Railroad Agent Brimstone, has been killed. My mission to obtain the whereabouts of the railroad headquarters from her was unsuccessful. She hired me as a detective to find her long-lost mother, but during the course of my interaction with her, she discovered my actual purpose. She had to be destroyed before she could give away my cover. The Synth Retention Bureau will be upset about this, but the additional agent names I was able to coerce from her before her death will certainly be of value. And in the final one, I've been tasked with reclaiming or destroying two escaped synths, R311 and PR15. These are highly optimized combat units who may have had their memories erased by the railroad. It is unclear if they retain any memory that they are synths. However, the two of them have been spotted several times meeting in secret at Fairline Hill Estates, which is odd behavior. It seems that they might remember each other, which means their memories may somehow be returning. R311, or Burner, has been located with a raider gang at Backstreet Apparel. PR-15, or Captain Jansen, has been located with a gunner squad at Hub City Auto Wreckers. With the penthouse possibly being compromised, all of the additional data I've uncovered about them during my investigation has been uploaded to the secure database at University Point. File number SRB XRJ33806. Based on their observed pattern, they should be meeting again tonight at Fairline Hills Estates. I'll be waiting there to get the surprise advantage. Well, it looks like B-263's advantage was not that great. Here he lies dead, and we see char marks on the wall. It looks as if these two escaped synths were far too much for B-263 to handle. But now, we have to make a decision. Do we go after these two escaped synths? Or do we go and read the additional data that B-263 collected about them, which is being stored inside a data bank at University Point? Well, we can kill these guys at any time, so let's start by heading to University Point. We arrive to see a synth on patrol in the distance. The coordinates points us to the nearby University Point Bank, but not the lobby of the credit union. Instead, we need to go around and through a broken wall in the main building to access the employees section of the University Credit Union. Inside, we find a patrolling synth. Is someone present? Alaska's liberation is imminent. And near to his corpse is a brand new terminal that we didn't see when we came here last. For the full story of University Point, you can see my video on the place by clicking here. Accessing the terminal, we can use the encryption key we found on B-263's body to access it. Inside, we find three entries. The first, view file SRB X3J33806, targets are Institute escapees, R311, male, and PR15, female. Both are highly trained combat units. R311, or Burner, has been located with a raider gang at Backstreet Apparel. PR15, or Captain Johnson, has been located with a gunner squad at Hub City Auto Wreckers. They've been laying low the last couple of weeks, but I've tracked them down. R311 became the leader of a raider gang and is going by the name of Burner. PR15 assumed the name of Carol Jansen and has joined the Gunners. She quickly rose in the ranks to captain due to her battle proficiency. During initial recon, it appeared that their memories had been erased. However, the two of them began meeting in secret at Fairline Hills Estates, a previously known rendezvous point for the railroad that is no longer in use. 
intercepted communications between Burner and Captain Jansen indicate that they have somehow began to regain their memories and are planning on fleeing the Commonwealth. They must be stopped before this can happen. Confronting them at their respective locations would not be a good idea. The best strategy would be to wait until they're alone. Based on observations, they've been meeting every nine days. So I'll catch them off guard then. Next, we can view the intercepted logs that B-263 said that he recovered from the two missing synths. However, these logs all appear to come from one of the synths, PR-15, or the gunner, Captain Jansen. The first entry is on October 4th, 2287, which is exactly 19 days before the sole survivor leaves Vault 111. Been having nightmares lately. Wake up sweating. Some kind of bright room. People in lab coats standing over me. I can't move. Then there's this creepy old house with people I feel like I recognize but have never seen. Been happening for weeks now. The house keeps getting clearer each time. Looked like the places out at Fairline Hill Estates. I'm gonna drop by there for the hell of it and see what's around. In the next one, written a day later, you gotta be kidding me. I went to poke around Fairline Hills and saw some raider sneaking around the place. I snuck up on him, but he was quick. He flipped around, gun out, but we immediately recognized each other. He was one of the faces from my dream. He's been having the same dreams too. What the heck is happening? In the final one, written nine days later on October 14th, we met up again last night. Both of us have been seeing synth patrols sniffing around a lot more lately for some reason. Since we've met, our memories keep getting stronger. It seems like we used to be different people, and some sickos erased our memories. Who would do that? Who would rob us of our past like that? That is the last of the intercepted logs, and now we have to make a choice. Do we delete all files, allowing this raider and gunner to escape the cold hands of the Institute? Or do we pick up where this courser left off and kill them ourselves? We'll explore both options, but let's start by assassinating these synths. Traveling to Hub City Auto Wreckers, we find it heavily fortified and guarded by half a dozen gunners, including one gunner Assaultron. I already did a video exploring this place, and if interested, you can watch that here. But we find Captain Jansen on the ground level, hiding behind some machinery. At this point, I thought we killed her, but after clearing the rest of Hub City Auto Wreckers, I found that she was still alive. It must have been a weird quirk with Mysterious Stranger. Maybe because she's a quest NPC, the game doesn't allow an NPC like the Mysterious Stranger to kill her. Yeah. With Captain Jansen finally dead, we can inspect her inventory. On her body, we find a laser rifle, a full suit of combat armor, a synth component, and Captain Jansen's journal. Captain Jansen's journal has all the same terminal entries we read at University Point. Remember that B-263 intercepted them, except for one new one. This one is dated October 23rd, 2287, the very day the sole survivor emerges from Vault 111, and likely written after she and Burner killed B-263 at the Fairline Hills Estates. Whatever we are now, or whoever we used to be, we want no part of it. Burner and I have decided to get the heck out of here the first chance we have. When we met up again at Fairline tonight, some jerk was waiting there for us. He said we had to come with him, but when we said no, he tried to take us out. I don't think he expected us to fight back so hard. He's dead now, but who knows if there are others after us. We've made a pact to trust no one going forward. Anyone else comes asking questions, or we see someone we don't recognize, we shoot on sight. No hesitation. 
I'm getting tired of life here anyway. I've been wondering if there's anything left outside the Commonwealth. So it looks like Jansen and Burner were planning to leave the Commonwealth together. But before they could, we showed up to finish the work of B-263. Next, we have to find Burner. And so we head to Backstreet Apparel. Thankfully, he is standing right outside, so we don't have to go through the building to kill him. On his body, we find another suit of combat armor and a few powerful weapons, and a synth component, but no holotape or other note. But after killing Burner and Captain Jensen, we have to go back to University Point to get the location of the penthouse key. So alternatively, we could skip both of those fights by going back in time and, before heading to the Hub City Auto Wreckers, simply choosing the option on the University Point terminal to delete all files. Incidentally, if we try to track down Burner and Jensen after we delete the data, we discover that they have gone. So really it's a choice of either killing Burner and Jensen or deleting the data. All case files in this databank will be deleted. Are you sure? Yes. Once B-263's files are deleted, or after the synths are dead, we find an incoming message from the Institute. Begin message. B-263. The penthouse location has been verified as secured and clear of any monitoring devices. The locks have also been changed. The new key can be found at drop location A-17. Continue covert service operations as normal and await further instructions. Well, after presumably downloading this information to our Pip-Boy, the coordinates for the drop location A-17 appear to be right on the fallen sky bridge in the heart of downtown Boston. Fast Traveling there, we appear amidst a horde of super mutants. Of course, we could avoid having to fight through all of them if we fast traveled to another location close by and simply walked to the drop location. Anyway, when the super mutants are dead, we can take a nearby elevator down to the ground floor. This brings us to a plaza right in front of Hub 360. Here we would normally have to kill even more super mutants, but I recently cleared this place for a video I did on the Captain Cosmos creation. The location points us to a half-buried mailbox in an alleyway by a bus next to Hub 360. Inside, we find the Noir penthouse key. Now we just have to find the penthouse. We don't know where this is, but for some reason our Pip-Boy does. After killing a super mutant hound, it tells us that the Noir penthouse is inside Hub 360. We are well familiar with this place by now, after having explored it during the Captain Cosmos creation. Heading inside, we pass the door to Hubris Studios, where we found the Captain Cosmos power armor, and instead head up the stairs in the middle of this lobby. Here we see what was previously two elevators, but with this creation installed, the second broken elevator is now a functional door. A door to the Noir Penthouse we can unlock with the Noir Penthouse key. And at last, we complete the quest Early Retirement, and we can walk right into our brand new Noir apartment. And look at this thing. We're just in the entryway hallway, and it is gorgeous. Look at the detail. This thing has completely custom and unique wallpaper, ceiling tiles, even door patterns. He's cleaned up some of the magazine cover artwork that we find in the game and added them as posters. Opening the first door to the left, we arrive in the guest bedroom and it is stunning. Beautiful hardwood floors. Even the radiator on the floor matches the style of this place. And the assets here look completely unique. Unique bed with a unique side table lamp and looking out the window to the east. Oh my gosh. What a stunning view of Boston. This guest room has a little office, beautifully decorated with wall-mounted shelves, gorgeous looking furniture, and there's a terminal here. B-263's journal. Item 1, penthouse cleared. B-263, the penthouse location has been verified clear of any monitoring devices. Terminal-based communications and data storage may resume. In the next one, suspend communications. B-263, 
Communications from this location must cease immediately. We have reason to believe that Institute communications are being intercepted, so all service locations must be inspected and cleared before communications can proceed. Please log additional information to Holotape and upload data to secured Institute terminals only. You will be notified when Penthouse communications can resume. Was this sent before or after the last one? I'm assuming after, since it comes after the last message. We read a message from the Institute at University Point that they've finished clearing this apartment of all bugs and listening devices, but the interesting thing about this entry is that if the first note is to be believed, it means this very same apartment had already at one time been bugged previously. In the first message, the Institute says that they removed all bugs. In the second message, they say no more transmissions because we've got new bugs, and it's only until we get the message at University Point that the Institute says that the courser can come back and resume communications. Who is constantly tapping this apartment? The railroad? Next, we find log entries numbered 1, 2, and 3, giving us another indication that these are in descending, not ascending order. In log entry 1, the Institute has recently assigned me to do undercover surface work, disguised as a human detective. An old penthouse apartment in Hub 360 has also been refurbished to provide me with a safe, clean headquarters. Getting in and out of the building itself can be tricky with all the super mutants around, but I can manage. I am to assist humans in the Commonwealth with personal cases in order to build my reputation, while widening the network in which I can obtain information about the enemies of the Institute. In the next one, entry number two, I've been hired to complete my first case as detective. A man believes his brother is a synth and wants me to investigate him. This situation could not be more perfect. If he is, in fact, a known escaped synth, he will simply be reclaimed and brought to the SRB. This, I believe, is a reference to one of the first scenes we see upon entering Diamond City. Kyle holding his brother Riley up with a pipe pistol, with Kyle accusing Riley of being a synth until Diamond City Security intervenes and kills Kyle. Turns out that neither of them were synths. And in the final one, Log Entry 3, a report has come through that a possible railroad field agent, codenamed Brimstone may be seeking personal assistance to find a long-lost relative. I have been instructed to do everything I can to stage a run-in with her. She may have knowledge of the inner workings of the railroad, including the location of their headquarters. We remember from his previous log that he never managed to get the location of the railroad's headquarters from Brimstone, though he did kidnap her, interrogate her, get the names of other railroad agents before killing her. Backing out of the terminal, we can continue exploring this gorgeous apartment. We see another window out to the Commonwealth. A beautiful, unique couch here I haven't seen anywhere else in the game. There's even a standing mirror nearby. And so far, we've explored only one room. Heading back to the hallway, we can open the door across the hall. This leads to a bit of a laundry room decorated with laundry equipment. Here we find a fuse box providing 100 power, and on the southern end, we find a workshop. Despite how beautiful this noir apartment is, the workshop itself is still really grimy. Heading back out to the hallway, sure enough, we can scrap anything. Pictures, art, furniture, even the curtains on the windows. So although this is gorgeous the way it is, if we want, we can make alterations. And heading over to the Creation Club section of our settlement build menu, we find a new build menu here called Art Deco. I'll explore this in depth in a moment. Heading down the hallway, we find a console to the right. Look at this thing. And another restored cover of La Coif. And then turning around, look at this bookcase. Can we open it? Ah, oh, that sound effect. Let's hear that again. What do you do with that? Oh my goodness. It's beautiful. I could open and close this all day. Opening the main doors, we enter the living space. And my god. This is stunning. The living area is recessed in the middle of the room. We see a gorgeous ceiling light hanging from the ceiling, and look at those beams of light streaming in from the windows. Turning around, we find a little bit of a kitchen. There's a bar here with some bar stools and a bunch of containers. Incidentally, look at the way the light is cast on the kitchen counter. That's because of the Venetian blinds partially obscuring a window to the east. I love these Venetian blinds. 
Turning right, we find a door to the south. This leads to a bit of a workshop. All right, look at that. We find a number of unique crafting stations here. This here is the chemistry station, modified to fit the look and feel of this noir apartment. Here we've got a weapons workbench, again, modified to fit this tight space. And then next to this is a modified armor workbench. Nearby we have a power armor station. Not sure what a courser would need with a power armor station, but I'm not going to complain, we can find it useful. And behind us is another terminal, but this one has all the same notes as the last one we read. Heading out the western door leads us back to the living room. Going around the perimeter, we find a beautiful dresser, more gorgeous windows out into the commonwealth. Interesting, however, that we have a penthouse view, even though the door to the apartment was only on the second floor of Hub 360, and the door we opened to get here was not an elevator. There's a wood-burning fireplace, another one of these bookcases. I love that sound. And then moving west, we find a huge window, and look at those god rays. We can even see dust particles floating in this space. Turning north, we find another fuse box, providing 100 power and a door. This leads to the master bedroom. More beautiful decorations, consoles, dressers, and shelves. And look at this bed. I love that the sheets are not neatly folded. They look crumpled up a bit, as they typically would in a real house. The master suite has a master bath. Opening the door, we can step inside. You know what I love most about this? The way he tweaked the lighting. Looking back into the bedroom, we see that he took great care to make sure that the noir apartment had a warm lighting template, almost like some sort of filter. But here in the bathroom, we have a much brighter and cooler template, which is much more suitable for a bathroom. Wonderful attention to detail. And look at that, against the wall to the east, we find wall cabinets that function as containers. And they are functional containers complete with animation. The master suite has its own office with its own gorgeous window looking out to the west. We find another terminal, but it has all the same terminal entries. Heading back out to the living room, we can again admire those god rays. Even though this is its own interior cell, it does share a day and night cycle with the rest of the world. So if we come here at night, instead of beautiful god rays and a sunset, we see stars shining out the windows. And that's about it for the noir apartment. Now, when we take a look at our Pip-Boy map, we notice that there's no fast travel marker. We can fast travel away from it, but we can't fast travel to it. However, this problem fixes itself the next time we visit Hub 360. The next time we arrive outside Hub 360, we see an undiscovered location marker on our Pip-Boy compass. Then, as we get close, we discover the Noir apartment. I'm not sure why the marker doesn't work the first time we enter the apartment, but at least we eventually get it. Next, let's go over all of the new settlement build items we get. I went ahead and organized them by furniture type here. We've got a beautiful Art Deco square geometric rug. There are two dressers. One is a single wide thinner dresser and the other is a double wide dresser, both of which can be used as containers and they have animated drawers, which is a wonderful touch. And notice that these are completely unique. It's not like he used an existing model in the game and just retextured it. No, these are completely unique models. It comes with three different radios, each tuned to the radio station of our choice. And he reskinned this radio to look clean and beautiful. Look at that retexture. There is one wall-mounted light. I went ahead and put it on this tree. It is glowing right now. I've got some ambient electricity in this area. It's a nice triangular Art Deco light, like a wall sconce, really. Here are the tables. This is the office desk. It functions as a container with an animated drawer, and it comes with two new desk lamps. This one's almost an oriental-looking lamp, and this is your classic writer's lamp, only it's blue instead of green. Here's the coffee table with animated drawer and a side table also with an animated drawer. Here's the dining table. It's a darker wood than much of the other furniture and it comes with two beds. The difference between the two is the color of the comforter, ivory or a coffee color. And here's my favorite, the bookcase with the lovely sound effect. Oh, I could listen to that all day. Here's some cabinets and consoles. They work as containers and this has animated doors. 
And here's the console with white animated drawers. On the ground, we've got the second of two rugs. Instead of geometric squares, we've got geometric lozenges. And it's a pale yellow color. Then there's a standing mirror. We don't see our own reflection, but it does reflect light. You can see the light emanating from my Pip-Boy moving around. And then here are the two chairs. One high-backed leather dining chair and one green leather lounge chair with matching ottoman. Here's the couch, complete with throw pillows. Can't have a good couch without throw pillows. And then the mod comes with a bunch of new posters. We've seen these all before, but they're cleaned up, fixed up, and framed. No more ratty edges, no more holes and dirt marks. They are gorgeous. Now let's go over the gear. The unique weapon we get is early retirement. This is a legendary 44 revolver. As we saw earlier, it does 25% more damage against synths, and it has all the same mods as a typical 44 pistol. It comes with the standard receiver, the bull barrel, the standard grip, and the reflex sight. But we can upgrade this any way we see fit. It is compatible with the Creation Club weapon skins if we want to paint it, but it comes with its own unique skin. Here's what it looks like. As you can see, the standard grip has a much lighter wood finish than the one we find in the game, and it has these two bronze nails. The comfort grip is a black leather with silver nails. The barrel and receiver have a darker gunmetal color compared to the vanilla revolver's silver color. And we see two red dots by the safety on either side of the weapon. This is a clear reference to the pistol used by Rick Deckard in the first Blade Runner. Though the shape of the weapons are very different, both have a similar stock, the same gunmetal color, and the two red dots. You know me, I love unique weapon skins. I love guns with personality. And this one certainly fits the style of a film noir era detective. Next is the outfit. We found the legendary detective coat on the corpse of the courser. It is legendary, reducing damage from robots by 15%. And its base stats are surprisingly decent with 14 ballistic damage resistance and 27 energy damage resistance. But most importantly, yes, it is compatible with Ballistic Weave. It looks like Nick Valentine's detective coat, only it has been reskinned. The undershirt is a teal color, the tie is a dirty red, and the jacket is a long brown trench coat. I think this is a reference to Rick Deckard's character from the first Blade Runner. The jacket color is spot on identical, and the shirt is similar. Both have teal, though the ties are very different between the two. It is tattered, patched, and ratty, just like Nick's, and I like it better that way. The fedora does not have a legendary effect. Its stats are pretty good for a fedora, two ballistic damage resistance and five energy damage resistance, but sadly it cannot be modified with ballistic weave. It looks just like the worn fedora used by Nick Valentine. Only instead of gray, it has been retextured to look brown, but it has all of the same rips, tears, and patches in it that we have come to know and love from Nick's fedora. One more thing, Bethesda has also released new pre-war product brand-themed Pip-Boy skins. These are easy to miss because they're not in a bundle and they're not featured right now. You can only find them at the moment by browsing through the Skins tab of the Creation Club. I really like these because these pre-war brand skins are not part of a pack, have no artificial countdown timers, and are not marked as exclusive limited time offers. They're simply available for sale as they should be. And that is a breath of fresh air. Each one is selling for 50 credits. There's the Abraxo skin, Arc Jet, Grey Tortoise, the cigarette company in the game, Red Rocket, Vim, and Vim Refresh. I'll show these skins off in detail while I talk about my criticisms of the Noir Apartment. Starting with the positives, I think the apartment itself is the best player home I have ever seen. This is of course subjective, but of all the player homes I've seen in both mods and Creation Club creations, it's the most beautiful in my opinion. It's not unique. There are a few other noir apartment mods that have been available for quite some time. I've even reviewed some of them in previous mod musters. I'll link to them in the description below. But in my opinion, it is the best one. It's not too large and sprawling. 
It's not too small and cramped. It's gorgeous. It has a wonderful layout. And I love how much attention was paid to the lighting in the various rooms of the apartment. And the views out the windows are absolutely stellar. Some of the best views of Boston in the entire game. The new furniture pieces are gorgeous. I don't know when I'm going to have an opportunity to actually use them because I tried to create a scrappy scavenger theme with all of my settlements. I think that better fits the feel of the game. I don't think I have a single settlement that's clean and pristine. But when it comes to clean, pristine furniture, this noir suite is the best I've seen. I love it much better than the mid-century modern set, which itself was really well done. I love how many unique containers come with the set, and how the drawers and doors are articulated. The loot we get is thematic and works with the mod, though ultimately, they're unimpressive unless you're doing a Rick Deckard cosplay playthrough. The trench coat and hat are just reskinned versions of what Nick has. They look nice, and they fit with the mod, but they're just not terribly exciting. I have similar thoughts about the revolver. The unique skin is beautiful, though I don't think it's unique enough. The unique weapon skins I like the best convey a lot of character onto the weapon. They have scratches or messages from previous owners, have been modified by previous owners, but this one just looks like a different color of 44. It's nice, don't get me wrong, it's just not thrilling. But all of the gear is really incidental to the apartment itself, so I just consider these to be wonderful bonuses. My biggest problem is with the story. I realize that it's supposed to be an homage to Blade Runner, Rick Deckard hunting replicants, and B-263 hunting escaped synths. I get it. And if it were being sold as a Blade Runner homage, then I'd be totally fine with the story, even though I'm personally not interested in a Blade Runner themed creation. But it's not. It's trying to masquerade as a lore friendly story. And as a lore friendly story, it just doesn't make any sense. Now, while I was recording this video, I went off on a tangent and ended up criticizing the plot for a good 16 minutes. I didn't want to bog down this video with all of that, so I cut it. But if interested, you can watch that much longer and more detailed criticism by clicking here. Instead, let me give you my summary. I don't think that coursers, as depicted, work that way in the Institute. Coursers are not detectives, instead they're just blunt instruments used by the Institute. Second, I don't think the Institute would ever create a noir-themed home for their topside coursers. If they ever did create a home for coursers, it would be Institute-themed, not noir-themed. But more importantly, the Institute can teleport. There's absolutely no need for a topside safe house used by Institute coursers. The safest place would be the Institute, and they can already teleport there. I think all of the terminals holding sensitive information scattered around the wasteland are reckless, and the Institute would never do that. Instead, they would just teleport back to the Institute and store all of their data there. I think the location of the penthouse at Hub 360 is a really bad location. If anything, a courser is going to attract attention to himself when exiting or entering his home because he has to fight through so many super mutants. And yes, he could teleport inside the safe house, but then what's the point of it? He could just as easily teleport to the Institute. I think the story of this courser is just too similar to the story of Nick Valentine. It borrows too heavily from his personal story. They're both synths, they both dress like noir detectives, and they're both trying to establish positive reputations with the people of Diamond City. I don't think Diamond City needs two detectives. And it's bizarre that we haven't heard of this synth detective at all, considering he's been working in Diamond City for a very long time to have established the reputation he's supposed to have. In my longer video, I talked about a lot of other little things that bothered me. The deviation from the standard synth naming mechanism, the fact that we've never seen any of Dr. Amari's mind wipes fail before, the fact that the apartment is on the second floor of Hub 360, but it has a beautiful penthouse view from the top, and a lot of other stuff like that. In short, I love the finished product. The apartment is stunning, and the gear is icing on the cake. But the lore of the quest frustrated me and ultimately detracted from my enjoyment of this creation. So is it worth it? Well, it depends on what you want out of it. If you're wanting a new player home for a brand new playthrough, then yeah, I'd say it's worth it. It's a gorgeous player home, one of the best I've ever seen. It has plenty of containers to store all of our goods, and we can customize it any way we want. I still think 600 credits is a little bit expensive, but the resulting product is still really high quality. But if your goal is to get a great story, and the apartment is incidental to that story, 
then I couldn't recommend it. I walked away being frustrated by the story instead of impressed by it. But those are just my thoughts. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Did you have similar criticisms of the story or did the story not bother you at all? And you think I'm just blowing things out of proportion? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I publish many new videos each and every week here on my channel, so if you want to make sure you don't miss my next episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I have a brand new shirt in the shop. Who's a good boy? It's everyone's favorite German Shepherd, available on shirts in a variety of both men's and women's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can also get it on other products as well, smartphone cases, mugs, pillows, posters, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon this coming week with a brand new video.